Hello class, in this video we're going to cover, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to cover 14.6, um, triple integrals and applications. And so um, there are not too many problems, there's only about nine problems in here. Um, so the very first one, uh, it does have some red stuff, so the bounds may be different on your problem, but the integration steps should be very, very similar. So if I just wrote this problem, we have the integral uh, with respect to y from 0 to 3, the integral with respect to z from 0 to 4, and the integral with respect to x from 0 to 1 of this function right here. And so since our first variable of integration is x, um, the integral of x is x squared over 2. y acts like a constant, so the integral of y is y times x. And z also acts like a constant, so the integral of z is z times x. And then we are to evaluate this from 0 to 1. So we plug in 1 here, 1 squared is 1, so we get 1 half. Um, y times 1 is y, and then z times 1 is z. Minus, now if I plug in 0 for x into each of these uh, expressions, I'm going to get 0, 0, and 0. So we end up with just this expression, 1 half plus y plus z. Now I must integrate this with respect to the variable z. So the in, this is a constant, so the integral of it would be that constant times z. This acts like a constant, so the integral would be y times z. And then the integral of z itself with respect to z is z squared over 2. My bounds for z were from 0 to 4, so I do have to evaluate this from 0 to 4. So when I plug in 4 for z, half of z is 2. When I plug in 4 for z here, y times 4 is 4y. And then here, 4 squared is 16 divided by 2 is 8. When I plug in 0 for z, each term becomes a 0. And so all I have left is the integral of 4y, and then 2 plus 8 is 10. So this integral needs to be with respect to y. So the integral of 4y with respect to y is 4y squared over 2, and the integral of 10 with respect to y is 10y. These do simplify to a 2, but I do have to evaluate from 0 to 3. So when I plug in 3, I get 3 squared, which is 9, times 2 is this 18. And then 10 times 3 is this 30. But when I plug in 0, I get 0 for both terms, OK? So 18 plus 30 is the answer 48. And that is what I answered in the answer box, and it was correct. Um, for number two, let's see what we have for number two. For number two, the bounds are the same for both of us, but your exponents may be different than mine, OK? So first, I'm going to integrate with respect to x. So both of these act like a constant, and the integral of x squared is x cubed over 3. And so if I plug in 1, this becomes 1 third. And if I plug in negative 1, it becomes negative 1 third. But I'm subtracting that negative 1 third. So you have 1 third y squared z squared, and then actually plus 1 third y squared z squared, which is where we got 2 thirds y squared z squared. Now I'm integrating this with respect to y. So the 2 thirds and the z squared will act like a constant. And the integral of y squared is y cubed over 3. Again, I what I did was I went ahead and put the 2 and then the 3 times the 3, so it became 2 ninths. And the z squared, I pulled all of that out so that all I'm evaluating is y cubed from negative 1 to 1. So when I plug in 1, 1 cubed is 1 minus, when I plug in negative 1, negative 1 cubed is negative 1. So this actually turns to plus. So I'm actually multiplying by a 2. N times this 2 is where the 4 ninths came from. But I still have z squared. So now I'm integrating this with respect to z. 4 ninths is a constant multiplier. And then I get z cubed over 3. Um, and then here I get the same. Well, I did not pull out the 3 like I did before. I just left it alone. And I plugged in the 1 and I plugged in the negative 1. So I got 1 third minus negative 1 third, which is actually 2 thirds positive. So 4 ninths times 2 thirds was 8 over 27. And that one turned out to be correct. So for number three, 
This one will have different bounds, but the function part should be very similar, okay? But your bounds will be different. So by the time you get to the second um, integration, um, your function is not gonna look the exact same as mine, okay? Um, so if we go ahead and work on the first variable of integration, which is dz, then y acts like a constant multiplier. So the integral is gonna be that constant times z. But I do have to evaluate the z from the z bounds of zero to three over y. So um, when you plug in the three over y, you get three over y minus, when you plug in the zero, you get zero. So in the end, I just end up with three over y um, with the total evaluation. So now I'm taking this and I'm integrating this with respect to x, okay? So all of this will act like a constant multiplier and the integral of dx is x and then I have to plug in my bounds. So again, when I plug in y over six, I get y over six minus zero, which is just y over six in the end. Then what I did is I went ahead and multiplied these two terms, to these monomials together, which means the y's canceled. And then I reduced the three and the six into one half. And since it's just a constant, I pulled it out of the integral. And so all I'm integrating is sine of y dy. Um, and when I integrate sine of y dy, you end up with negative cosine of y. And then you still have to evaluate it at negative pi over two and zero. So you get negative cosine of pi over two minus negative cosine of zero. Those two will turn to a plus sign. And then cosine of pi over two is zero and cosine of zero is one. So really it's just one half times one, which is one half. And I did enter that in for number three and it was correct. Okay. Now you might be given a different function. So your function might be different from, or well, most likely it will be different from mine. You'll get lucky if it's the exact same, but you definitely need to understand why those are the bounds of integration. If you do not understand that now, when we get to the um, more complicated sections, you're gonna be at a complete loss if you can't even do this bare minimum part, okay? Um, so this is just like the, introduction to all of this, okay? We are going to use it for some more difficult and broader problems and applications. Um, so if you don't understand where everything is coming from and why it is what it is, it's gonna cause an issue later, okay? You just really won't even know what to do later um, if you don't understand this part. So I'm trying my best to explain this here on the paper. So it says, set up the triple integral for the volume of the solid, do not evaluate the integral, right? They don't want us to find the answer. They just want us to set it up, okay? And what it is, is it's the solid in the first octant bounded by the coordinate planes and the plane um, z equals one minus x minus y, okay? So we're bounded by the coordinate planes, right? Which means z equals zero, which is the x, y plane, y equals zero, which is the x, z plane, and then x equal to zero, which is the z, y plane. Okay. Um, what that means is I'm basically in above the x, y plane, right? When z is positive, I'm above the x, y plane, but I'm also just in the first quadrant of the x, y plane, okay? So that's what I tried to mention here. The first octant means I'm above the x, y plane, which means that the z's are gonna be going from zero to this plane that you have, this graph, um, since that plane is, is part of my boundaries, okay? But in the x, y plane, um, if you're talking about the first octant, that means the first quadrant in the x, y plane, okay? So what I wanted to do is, yes, I get that in the three-dimensional space, I'm going from, um, the x, y plane, which is a flat surface, right? And then the z axis goes up above that. So I'm going from zero, the x, y plane up until I get to this, this, uh, this other plane, one minus x minus y, okay? So that's another, another plane. It's probably like angled like this, right? So this is the, I'm trying my best here, <laughs> the little tiny video. So the x, y plane is my, my hand here that's flat and horizontal. And then the z-axis comes off of it like this, which is my hand that's vertical. But the plane that is uh, my boundary, it could be slanted like this. It could be slanted like this. It, I don't know what that plane's gonna look like, right? It's a three-dimensional space, so it could look any which way. Um, 
but I want to really have an idea of what it looks like in the two dimensional space. Since I already understand that the Z variable is going to go from zero to this height, whatever that height is, um, I also want to figure out where the X's are going and where the Y's are going. So in order for me to figure out what's happening in the X, Y plane, I need to let the Z value equal zero. So I took this uh, plane that they gave me and I made that Z zero. And so I have one minus X minus Y. Um, and then I just went ahead and added the Y so I could get this in terms of Y so I could graph it, okay? And so this is basically a uh, line that has a Y intercept of one and then it has a slope of negative one. So that means when I go down one and over one, I get another point. And I don't need to continue it because I should only be worried about what's in the first quadrant, okay? And so this is the region here in the XY plane. And then again, it's three dimensional. It does come up, right? Because the Z axis does come outward on top of this. Um, and so this little triangle is basically like a little prism that's coming up, okay? In three dimensional space. So I do know that the Y, the Z values are gonna go from zero, which is on the X, Y plane. And it's gonna go up until I get to the height of that little prism, okay? And that's what this represents. But how do I also get, um, the area of this to um, get the actual total volume because you need to know the area here and then you multiply that by your height in order to get your volume, right? So the Y would go, if I imagine like a little tiny rectangle, right? If you're thinking of Riemann sums because that's what integrals come from. But if you're talking about a little triangle in that region, remember it's going from zero, Y equal to zero to Y equals this line. So that means your y values are going from zero to one minus x. And then your x values would be your constants. So these little rectangles would sweep from, neg from zero all the way to where this region ends, which is the x value of one. And so the x uh, values are gonna go from zero to one. Now you always wanna have your constants on the outside and they kind of told me the order of my integration. So they told me that I was going to have dz first, then dy, then dx. So then you need to have the bounds of z first, which we already found, okay? You just can't, you can only have the variables y and x in here. Then when we go to figure out the bounds for y, remember, you only have one more variable of integration. So these bounds need to be in terms of uh, x's. So y equal to zero, there's no x's at all, it's still zero but it does go up to this, which is one over X. And that is in terms of X's. And then finally, your last term of integration should always have constants, okay? And we already determined that those constants for X would be between zero and one, okay? So that is where all of that information came from. Now, the second one is also a good one. So again, I'm trying my best to explain why this is what it is, okay? So this one says, set up a triple integral for the volume of the solid. Do not evaluate this integral. The solid bounded by z equal to that and z equal to zero. So essentially, if I'm bounded by this, this uh, function here, um, it, again, that's my height, right? Your z-axis is basically telling you the height, okay? So I'm going from zero, which is the xy plane, up high until I get to this um, solid boundary, okay? So that automatically tells me where the Z values are going, but if I wanna have any inclination on what the X's and the Y's are doing, I have to examine what's happening on the X, Y plane, okay? So if I wanna be on the X, Y plane, I have to let the Z equal zero, which means in my boundary, this becomes zero. So I have zero equal to this. If I square both sides, I still have zero equal to this. And then I went and added Y, squared over and then I took the square root of y. Whenever you take the square root of y on both sides, you have to put the plus or minus. You do not have a choice. That is the mathematical zero principle property, okay? Um, I think they call it in college algebra um, extracting roots or something like that um, or the square root property. So <clears throat> Whenever you take the square root on both sides of an equation, you do have to put plus and minus. Um, so really it's two functions. 
and y equal to the positive radical 4x or 49 minus x squared is actually the top half of a circle. And then y equal to the negative square root of all that is actually the bottom half of the circle. So the fact that I got plus or minus means that I have both parts in my um, region. And so then it's the full circle, okay? That is my boundaries. So obviously, um, if you draw that rectangle in there, the rectangle is going from this end of the circle, depending on where you are, it'll go from this bottom end of the circle to this top end of the circle, okay? And so no matter where you are, even if you're here, it'll go from there to there. Even if you're here, it'll go from there to there. It's always gonna be this bottom Y value to this top Y value, okay? And so those are gonna stay general in terms of X, which means X is the last variable, which means X needs to be in constant form. So where are, how far are these little rectangles gonna swoop, sweep across, okay? In order to get the whole, the whole area of this two-dimensional region, I am gonna have to sweep those rectangles from negative seven all the way to positive seven. So then that tells me that my X values are from negative seven to seven. So then that helps me. This top information told me that my Zs are going from zero to that boundary. Drawing it, I can tell that my rectangles are going from the negative, the bottom half of the circle to the top half of the circle. And then I know that those rectangles are sweeping across from negative seven to seven, okay? And that's where all of these bounds came from. So now we're gonna move on into number six. And number six is nice because they give us an image um, here. So we have Z equal to this. This is our plane. That is going to be this red, reddish side that you see here, okay? That is the plane there. Um, it is a little curvy if you, if you notice, okay? It's just a little bit curvy. Um, but bounds are also X equal to zero which is this line here and um, x equal to four, which is this line here. And then for y, y is also bound by y equal to zero, which is the x-axis and y equal to four, which is this line in the back, okay? And so drawing all those lines, the two axes and then the y, x equal to four and the y equal to four um, or x equal to four and y equal to four in that direction, um, in that order, I'm sorry. Um, it creates a rectangle down here, okay? And so you can see, not even a rectangle, it creates a square at the bottom, okay? So that is my two-dimensional figure there is a square. So you have y equal to zero, y equal to four, x equal to zero, and x equal to four. And it's this square that is your region, okay? Um, and so when I'm setting up my integral, I am going to do the same thing, I usually like to do dz, dy, dx. So for z, I know that I'm talking about, it's only in this first octant. So I know that z is gonna go from zero to that height, whatever it is, depending on where I'm at, right? In that box, depending on where I am in this box, it's gonna go so high. So if I'm more closer to this corner, my height is way up there somewhere, okay? So, the Z is gonna go from zero to this height. The Y is gonna go from zero to four. And then the X is also gonna go from zero to four. And so that's these bounds here. Then if we actually integrate, the integral of DZ is Z evaluated at the bounds. So we end up with two X, Y. Then we integrate this with respect to Y. So 2x acts like my constant multiplier and the integral of y is y squared over two. These guys cancel and then I evaluate this for y. So four squared is 16, zero squared is zero. So this is really just um, 16x, right? And the integral of 16x is gonna be 16 times x squared over two. These do simplify into eight. But if I plug in four, I get 16. And if I plug in zero, I get zero. So I end up with eight times 16, which was 128. And that is what I typed in in the box up there. Um, and it was correct. Now, number seven, um, 
the, oh, that's the camera shadow. I was like, what is this? I don't know that that is the camera shadow. Doesn't recognize any other shadow. Interesting. Okay, anyway, um, where was I? Number six, no, number seven. So number seven says, use a triple integral to find the volume of the side solid bounded by the graphs of the equations. And so they gave me Z equals eight minus X cubed. They gave me y equals negative x squared plus three. They gave me y equal to zero, z equal to zero, and x greater than or equal to zero. So obviously the z is going from zero to the height of this three-dimensional figure, okay? So I know where the z bounds are. The z bounds are gonna go from zero to this. So that's pretty simple, okay? But in the xy plane, um, I'm going to graph this information, okay? So in the x, y plane, these are my bounds. Now, if I draw this, this is basically a parabola, flip downward and shift it up three. So that's exactly what I've drawn here, okay? And if you want to know what these x-intercepts are, uh, I essentially just plugged in zero for y and then divided by negative so I got this, and then I took the square root of three and the square root of x squared. And I got these two x-intercepts. So that's the negative square root of three and the positive square root of three x-intercepts, okay? So look, you have y equal to zero, which is this line down here. You have y equal to negative x squared plus three, which is this here, okay? And so, so far the region that you've created is like this little dome inside here. However, we have to look at our restrictions for x. So x is supposed to be greater than or equal to zero. So it means I'm not in this region at all because those are not numbers. These are not x values greater than zero. So equal to x equal to zero is this and x greater than zero is everything to the right. So that's why I only shaded the half of the dome that was to the right of x equals zero. So then when I set up my bounds, if I draw a little rectangle in here, okay, the we already know the z bounds, the y is going to go from y equal to zero to y equal to negative x squared plus three. The x values are, or these rectangles are going to sweep in x values from zero to positive square root of three, which is my bounds here, okay. Then from there, we're going to go ahead and evaluate everything. So the integral of dz is just z from zero to eight minus x cubed, which gives me eight minus x cubed. The integral of this with respect to y, well, all of this acts like a constant multiplier. And the integral of dy is just y evaluated at my bounds. So when I evaluate it at my bounds, I just end up with negative x squared plus three, but I have that constant multiplier. And so since I am integrating with respect to x, I did go ahead and FOIL these all out. So when I FOILed everything out, I ended up with these four terms. And then I integrated each term individually. And then I went ahead and tried to evaluate this. So I plugged in the square root of 3 everywhere there was an x. And when I plug in 0 for every single term, I just get a bunch of zeros. So I just put minus a big fat zero because they're all zeros. Um, here, when I type square root of three cubed in my calculator, it gave me three square root of three. That one, I didn't do anything to it. Here, when I typed in square root of three to the power six, it gave me 27. And then here, when I typed in three, or no, I put three fourths over here. But when I typed in the square root of three to the fourth power, it gave me nine. So I still have to multiply that. So here, now that I know that this is three square root of three, it did cancel the three in the fraction. So I ended up with negative eight times square root of three. Here that stayed. Here I reduced this by three and three, and I got nine over two. And then here, if I put this over one, I multiplied top times top, bottom times bottom, I ended up with this fraction. Now these are like terms because they both have the radicals. So negative eight of these plus 24 of these gives me positive 16 of these. Then nine halves minus 27 over four was actually negative nine fourths. 
And so I can't simplify this anymore because these are not like terms. One of them has a radical and the other one doesn't. So I just left it like that and it did accept my answer just like that um, for number seven. Two more problems in this section. So number eight, um, because these problems with the mass and um, centers of mass are very long, typically they don't ask you for the whole center, the X coordinate, the Y coordinate, and the Z coordinate. Um, I noticed that in WebAssign, they just ask you for one of the coordinates. And as long as you know how to find one of them, you should be able to find all the others. Um, but it just takes a lot of time. So to keep your time in mind, they just ask for one, okay? So for number eight, my row function is K times Y. My region here that we're talking about, Q means the regions in three-dimensional space, okay? Um, it does say I'm bounded by all of these. So we've got this. If I solve for Z, excuse me, if I solve for Z, I'm gonna have the minus six Y and minus six X, and then I'm gonna have to divide by positive five. So I did that, and then I just split this up. That six, this is negative six fifths X and negative six fifths Y. So this is Z, Z is equal to this. And it tells me that my bounds are from uh, using that plane and Z equal to zero. So again, I'm talking about the height of that region, okay? So I tried to draw it in three-dimensional space, okay? So basically your little rectangles, any, depending on where I am in here, my rectangle is gonna go from the X, Y plane where Z equals zero up until it gets, it lands on this plane here. So that's the height there, okay? They're trying to figure out the height that is Z and Z goes from zero to that plane. Now, for y, in order for me to determine where y and x are going, I have to see it in the xy plane. So I went ahead and took this whole equation right, or took this equation right here, and I made z equal to zero, which means that this term right there disappears. So you end up with 6x plus 6y equal to 30. I minus the 6x over, I divided everybody by 6, and I got that y equals 5 minus x. So that means that I have a y-intercept of five. And then if I go down one and over one, down one and over one, down one, and over one, down one and over one, I also end up at positive five in x, okay? And so then the region they're talking about is bounded by y equal to zero, right? x equal to zero, and then this line y equals to five minus x. So how do my rectangles look in here? They look like my y's are going from zero to this line. So zero to five minus x. And then those rectangles are getting spanned from zero to five. And so my x bounds are from zero to five. And there's my row function. So I'm gonna go ahead and evaluate this. If I am integrating with respect to z, then that means k times y is my constant multiplier. And so I just get Z evaluated at my bounds, which is just that top bound in the end. Okay, because when you minus zero, it doesn't do anything. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this K because K is not a Y or an X. So it is truly just a constant. So I took it out to the front. However, I am going to have to integrate with respect to Y next. So I did distribute the Y here. So I ended up with six y minus six fifths x times y minus six fifths and now y squared. Um, and when I integrate this, I get six y squared over two. I get six um, x y squared over two, but there was already a five down there. So it created a 10 down there. And then minus six y cubed over three, but there was already a five down there. So five and the three made 15. Now I evaluate this, or no, I simplified it first. So that simplifies to a three. These guys simplify into three over five, and these guys reduce to two over five. Then I plugged in my five minus X and my zero. Since all of these terms have a Y in it, when I plug in zero for Y, they're all gonna turn to a big fat zero. So I'm subtracting a big fat zero. Doesn't really do anything. So I'm just gonna plug in the five minus X for Y. And I end up with three times five minus X squared minus three X over five times five minus X squared minus two fifths and then five minus X cubed. 
I noticed that all of them had this five minus X and the one the lowest exponent there was squared. So I took out a five minus X squared, which means for this first term, all I'm gonna have left is a three. For the second term, I'm gonna have left over the minus three X over five. And for the last term, I only took out one. So I'm still left with negative two over fifth times the extra one that I did not factor out. So I went ahead and distributed this negative two and I got negative or negative two fifths. I got negative two and then I got plus two X over five. Then I simplified this because three minus two is one and negative three X over five plus two X over five was a negative one X over five. Okay. So then now I went ahead and I squared this, right? So I did, basically I did five minus X times five minus X and foiled it and then combined my like terms you end up with 25 minus x, 10x plus x squared, and then this one came down. Since I am integrating with respect to x, I am going to want to FOIL all of that out. So when I FOIL it out, I got these terms. Then I combined my like terms. So 25, those two together make 15x, these two together make 3x squared, and then you have this term. Then if I integrate, I get 25X, I get negative 15X squared over two, three X cubed over three, and then X to the fourth over four, but there was already a five down there. So that's where the 20 came from. And then I'm evaluating it from five to zero. So when I plug in five here, I get five. When I plug in five here, I get 375 over two. When I plug in five here after the threes cancel, I get 125. And when I plug in five here, I get 125 over four. I think I got 375 over 20, but I reduced it by five and that's where I got 125 over four. Now, when you plug in zero for every single one of these, they're all gonna give you zero. So you're just subtracting one big fat zero. Now I did go ahead and put these two together and then got a common denominator of four. This one I made have a common denominator of four and this one already had a common denominator of four. So when I combined all of these together, I ended up with 125 over four, of course, times that K constant from the very beginning, okay? Now they're asking me for Y bar. Well, in order to find Y bar, I had to remember that Y bar is MXZ over M, okay? Basically the Y missing. Why is the Y missing? Because the Y is in the integral, okay? So you have an extra Y times your row, which was K times Y. The bounds all stay the same, that does not change. I just have an extra variable in here. So this is actually gonna be KY squared, but because I'm integrating with respect to Z first, I'm just gonna get Z evaluated at those uh, endpoints or boundaries. So in the end, I just get that top expression, because when I minus the zero, it's just going to stay the same expression. Then I am integrating with respect to y next. So this time I kept the k in the inside. It doesn't matter. And, and I did it differently on purpose because it doesn't matter whether you kick it all the way out or you just leave it there. It's fine. And then this y squared, I just distributed to all three of these. So I ended up with six y squared minus six fifths x y squared minus six fifths y cubed. And then I integrated all of those guys. So I got six y cubed over three, six x y cubed over three, but there was already a five down there. So that's why it's 15. And here six fifths y to the fifth over five, but there was already a five down there, um, or I'm sorry, over four. So when I do y to the fourth over four, there was already a five here times the new four down there is where this 20 came from, okay? Then uh, I just reduced this and I got two. I reduced both of these by three, got two fifths. I reduced both of these by two and I got three tenths. And then I plugged in my bounds. So when I plugged in five minus X, I got two five minus X cubed minus two X over five times five minus X cubed minus three tenths, five minus X four minus when I plug in the zero, zero and zero. So it's just minus one big fat zero. So um, I factored out, they all had a five, X, five minus X in common. The smallest exponent was a cube. 
So I took out a five minus X cubed. With that gone, that leaves me with this two. With this gone, it leaves me with minus two X over five. And then with three of these gone, I still have one left. So I have minus three tenths times one of them left. So I did go ahead and take this negative three tenths and distribute and simplify. So I have two, this, this would be negative three halves and this and this would be positive three X over 10. And then the cube, I ended up breaking it into a square and then a just a one so that I can actually multiply it out. But in the next line, I am multiplying it out. So I did square it, right? The five minus X squared is 25 minus 10 X plus X squared. The first one is still there. And then I did distribute and combine like terms. So over here, when I distributed, I got negative three halves and a three X. I went ahead and combined these two to get me a negative one half. And I combined those two to get me, I think a negative five, a negative X over 10, okay? So when I combine those like terms, this is what I ended up with. And then now I went ahead, since this one was already foiled, I went ahead and foiled these two. So five times one half is five halves. Five times this fraction is this fraction. Negative X times one half is this. And negative X times negative X over 10 is a positive X squared over 10. Then I had to foil these guys out. So I did 25 times this, which gave me this. 25 times that, there we go. 25 times the last one, there we go after reducing. Negative 10 times this, I get this. Negative 10 X times X, I get this. Negative 10 X times this, I get this, okay? Um, then we move on to X squared times five halves, which gives me this. X squared times negative X, which gives me this. And then X squared times X squared over 10, which gives me X to the fourth, close the parentheses, DX. Now I did combine my like terms so constant came down, we had negative 25X and negative 25X, which made negative 50X. We had five uh, halves X squared plus 10X squared plus five halves X squared, which gave us 15X squared. Then we had um, negative X cubed and negative X cubed, which gave us negative two X cubed. And then of course we had the X to the fourth over 10. Now I'm gonna integrate. So when I integrate this constant, I get that constant times X. Here I get negative 50 X squared over two. Here I get 15 X cubed over three. Here I get negative two X to the fourth over four. And here I get um, X to the fifth over five, but there was already a 10 down there. So now there's a 50 down there. Um, and then I evaluated it at five. So when I plug in five, I got this. When I plug in five after I reduced, 25 times 25 was 625. Um, here I reduced, so I had five cubed, which is 125 times five, which is where 625 came from. Here, when I reduced, I have a two downstairs. So I have five to the fourth, which is 625 over two. Uh, or no, I'm sorry, five to the fourth power Five to the fourth power is 25 times 25, which is 125. That does not seem right to me. I think I have an error there, but the computer said it was correct. So give me dun dun dun, five cubed times five. Yep. So this should have been 625. Oh, that was 625 over five, where is this coming from? Oh, it's just a typo. This should be 625 over two. So this is 625 over two. And then this one would be, um, when you type in five to the fifth, you get some huge number, but when you reduce it with 50, you end up with 125 over two. So the negative 625 and the positive 625 do cancel. And the positive 625 over two minus 625 over two also cancel. And so you just have this 125 over two, but don't forget that constant K multiplier that's been coming down the whole time. So you end up for little m is 125 over two K. Now if you wanna find Y bar, 
you're going to take that m x z and divide it by m, which is the same as doing m x z um, times the reciprocal of m. And so you just flip this over and you get this. Well, the 125 k's cancel, you end up with 4 over 2, which is just 2. And so that's where I got the response for number 8. Now, for number 9, we had rho of x, or rho of x, y, z equal to uh, k times x. And my q region was z equal to 4 minus x, z equal to 0, y equal to 0, x equal to 0. So I drew um, z equal 4 minus x, and it's actually this line here in the x, z plane. However, because I don't know what the y value is, it could be anything random, it does keep going outward. So it, that, that, that plane will be as long this way as my y value is, okay? So remember, this is the bottom, okay? And then here's my line. So this is the back, like back wall, okay? So this is the ground, this is the back wall, but then it's like you're, on, you're in the attic and the roof goes like at a diagonal, right? And so then all your wall in that, attic, at least half of the attic, right? Because the other half would probably go down the other way. But you have this slanted wall on this side. This wall is going to have that same slant depending on how long your room is or how long your attic is, OK? So I don't know how far it's going to go out. Um, but until they gave me this bound right here, I saw the bound in there, um, y equal to 4. So that's right here at the bottom. I almost missed it when I was doing this problem the first time, like when I was actually working it out. But there is a bound y equal to 4. So I know that this, this line here is going to keep running all across until I get to that y equal to 4 line. OK? And so it looks like that. So we know that the height of this is going to be from the bottom to this line. OK? So the height for z is going to be from 0 to 4 minus x. Now, in the xy plane, again, this is not the way we look at an xy plane. We always like to have our x values positive on this side and our y value positive going up. But if you look at it, it's y equal to 0, y equal to 4, which is why the bounds for y are from 0 to 4. Then if you look at x, x is also going um, from 0 to 4. From this line, x equal to 0 to this line, x equals to 4. OK, so we are taking this and we are essentially creating a um, an triple integral for m. So 0 to 4 minus x for z, 0 to 4 for y, and 0 to 4 for x. Here's my row function. And when I integrate that with respect to z, this is going to act like a constant multiplier. When I plug in my bounds, I end up with just 4 minus x. Um, I'm integrating with respect to y first. I left my k there, but I did distribute this x. But this whole thing is going to act like a constant multiplier, and the integral of dy is just y. And I have to plug in my bounds. After I plug in my bounds, I get 4. So now I have 4k times this, OK? And I am going to go ahead and integrate these. So the 4k is the constant multiplier. And when I integrate 4x, I get 4x squared over 2. And when I integrate x cubed, I get, I mean, x squared, I get x cubed over 3. So these were reduced to a 2. So I end up with 4k times 2x squared minus this from 0 to 4. So when I plug in 4, I get 32. When I plug in 4 here, I get 64 over 3. When I plug in 0 into both, I get two zeros, which means I'm subtracting just one big fat 0 instead of two separate zeros. Um, and then when I computed this, it turned out to be 32 over 3. And so 4k times 32 over 3 was 128k over 3. So that was little n. Now the other thing they're asking me for is z bar. Okay. So z bar is going to be mxy. And so I'm going to have an extra z variable times my row function, my density function. So I have the z variable times the density function. And when I integrate this with respect to z, the kx acts like a multiplier. And the integral of z is z squared over 2. 
when I plug this in, I pulled the two out and put it underneath there. So notice that it's here now. And so all I'm evaluating is z squared from zero to four minus x. So I plugged in the four minus x squared and then I plugged in the zero, but zero squared is just zero. So I did actually square this. So I have the kx over two. And when I square that, I ended up with 16 minus eight x plus x squared. Now I am integrating with respect to y. Um, oh no, I think I distributed the x next, just so that all the x's were together. So this was k over two all by itself. And now that's 16 x minus eight x squared plus x cubed. But I'm integrating with respect to y. So all of this acts like a constant multiplier and you're just in uh, evaluating y from zero to four. Well, when I do that, I get four minus zero, which is just four. So this four is gonna reduce with this two and I'm gonna end up with two. So that's where the two k came from but I still have all of this that I have to integrate, okay? So when I integrate this one, it's 16 x squared over two. When I integrate this term, it's negative eight x cubed over three. And when I integrate the last term, it's x to the fourth over four, okay? Then this reduces and I just get eight, but now I'm plugging in four. So eight times 16 was 128. Here, four cubed is 64 times eight is 512 over three. And four cubed is 100, or four to the fourth power is 128 divided by four. Or no, I think it's 512. And then divided by eight. It's something, it's 256, I think. Four to the fourth power, four to the fourth power, and then divided by what? Four divided by four. And we get the 64. Okay. Um, and then if I added all of these together and multiplied by two is where I got the 128 over three. And then of course times K. Now, if you wanna do Z bar, you're gonna to have to do the M X Y, which we just got was 128 over three K. And then you have to divide by the M, which was also 128 over three K. So anything divided by itself is just one. And so for Z bar, we got the coordinate one. So that was the end of this section, just lots of practice with setting up and actually evaluating triple integrals, okay? Um, in the next section, we'll do a little bit more. I think it's applications in the next section, okay? Always, always make sure you read the lecture notes, right, before coming into these videos, because I'm using these formulas, and if you didn't see where the formula came from, you might be at a loss there but it is in the lecture slides where this formula is coming from. But other than that, I will see you in the next video.